Hello, world. What is up? Welcome to Build. Thank you, thank you. I'm your host, Matt Forte, and uh, we are here live at the Build Studio in New York City. Uh, speaking of live, real quick, uh, just a reminder to those tuning in, uh, have some fun. Think of a question for our guests, all right? Send it this way. Don't be shy. Uh, it's super easy. Just press the button on our site or hit us up on Twitter at Build Series NYC. Now, if you do a good job and we got the time, we just might ask it live. You could be internet famous, man, all right? So take a big swing. Go nuts. Uh, now, look, folks, in just two short days, March 1st, Gotham returns for the second half of its incredible fourth season. And all hints, teasers, and trailers point to an absolutely epic conclusion. We're about to bear witness to the emergence of the criminal landscape for which the city of Gotham is known best, my friends. And right in the thick of it all are my next guests. Lee Tompkins and Mr. Edward Nigma are here. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. Miranda Backern and Corey Michael Smith are in the house. How about that, huh? How exciting is that? <clears throat> now, you are correct to woo as such, because uh, they're pretty awesome, and they're here. And we're going to bring them out in just a second, talk about the show, the whole nine. We're going to do all that stuff. But before we do, I believe we have a sneak peek at one of the premieres. So let's go ahead and run that clip. Luke, do it up, man. Whoever this was needs to be made an example of. I mean, can't they tell you were trying to help? Maybe it wasn't one of them. Oh, of course it was. I just think that maybe the best thing for the Narrows is to burn it to the ground, start over. Well, that would certainly suit everyone, wouldn't it? I'm just saying someone tried to blow you to bits, and I bet they're going to try it again. So I'm going to find them, and when I do, Grundy's going to pull them apart, limb by limb. <laughs> Fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together. We're in the back with Corey Michael Smith. It's a real deal. <laughs> oh, man. Guys, welcome. Thank you so, so much for being here and, and making some time to come hang out with us. This is very exciting. Yeah, thanks for having us. Of course, always, always. Um, I want to get in. I want to talk about this show. So much to discuss. But before we get to any of that, how are you guys doing? How's it going? How's doing press great. going? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's been awesome. a fun day. It's been it's been a it's been a couple days of uh, getting excited for for the return on Thursday. Yeah. So you know we get to wear like pretty clothes and talk about a show that we love doing and talk so. about ourselves yeah <laughs> it's a rough gig right yeah it's, well you know i'm i'm so struck by uh you know we're like you can see everyone right do you ever have like streakers or like anything crazy happen during we this? haven't had streakers but you know what was really cool is samuel jackson was up here in radio man are you familiar with radio man uh infamous within you, yeah you know what i'm talking about in new york i know yeah. But, yeah so if you don't know who radio man is you can go to our site samuel jackson will explain it to you because he stopped his entire interview and he went hang on a second that's radio man across the street and then he explained to the entire room who radio man it was one of the greatest new york moments i've wow. ever seen in my life very cool that's awesome uh today you've got people there's uh lots of people out there yeah yeah maybe we'll get maybe we'll get a special person walking by today fingers crossed Keep your eyes we peeled. are live if anyone's watching this right now and you're in oh, walking gosh. distance of the We're studio in. get down here and i want a streaker yes <laughs> we want i want a streaker that could all right let's top see. the olympics <laughs> you hear about that streaker Yes, yeah. Oh, yeah, the guy that, there was like a streaker at the Olympics. A guy came down and he was wearing uh, like a tutu sort a tutu, of thing. A tutu, yeah. That's with, not streaking? With like stuff written on his, uh, you know, bare chest. That doesn't constitute streaking, does it? A no. tutu? No. No, that's not, it's not, it's not full commitment. No. Especially at the Olympics. Like, you gotta right? commit. That's where. You know, these people have been training their whole lives, sir, the and you come out in a tutu. I need, I need 100%. Yeah. That's not even bronze level streaking at that point. No. That doesn't even make it on the podium. I only bring all this up because whoever's watching and intends to streak for us, I just want to make sure you bring your A game, okay? Absolutely. Internet future streaker. <laughs> Bring your A game. All right, let's. Uh, enough of that, though. Uh, I, I like I said, I do want to get into the show. You said it's very exciting right now because you get to go around and talk about the show. You worked on the show so hard. Is this? Is there any nervousness at this point before it's no longer yours? It gets released into the wild. It belongs to the fans soon. How do you feel coming up? It never to that belongs moment? to us, really. No. Yeah, it moves I, through us. I mean, I, that, it's actually something that I, I I'm not used to it still, and I don't think I I ever will. Anytime I work on something. And you don't see it for a while. You, I get a, I get a little bit of anxiety over like yeah. it's wanting to see it and also hoping you know, it's not terrible. Uh, you know, there, there's always like a part of you. You know, you're like, well, I I did my best. Yeah, I mean, we do. I hope they edit this to make it even better. <laughs> we work on it, based for the better part of a year. You know, you don't really start seeing anything until you're at least like six months in or five months in or something. And yeah, it it. It's exciting for all of us. We have like usually premiere parties to watch it together, and it it gives us that ener energized, you know, 
to get us through. Is there a point uh, between uh, the beginning and end of the process where you can confidently say, oh, we didn't ruin it? Or do you need to see it? Do you need to see it to completion to know we made it? We stuck the landing. Luckily, we're not responsible that much for it. I mean, our performance is yes, but the show as a whole, there are a lot of components, a lot of yeah. people, a lot of, you know. Um, yeah, we can always blame somebody. Somebody. It's not our it's fault. It's never <laughs> our fault. Enough, you know, that scene didn't really work, but I think it was the editor. <laughs> <laughs> I, it certainly wasn't me. Yeah. Uh, props, I don't know, ruin that scene. <laughs> no, uh, uh, you know, it's, it, uh, what, what actually happens for me often is, you know, so episode 12 is airing on Thursday yeah. uh, in this season. We're filming episode 20 right now. Yeah. And so uh, it's, a long, it's a long season, and people are now, you know, we're so used to, to shorter seasons of shows now. It's a, that's a lot. It's a lot. It's, it's a lot of TV. And so we... You know, I try to think about like what happened in twelve, and it's like oh, it I just can't. becomes this amorphous like narrative where I'm like, I don't remember what episode that happened. Did I? I'm ter constantly terrified that I'm saying something that happens five episodes later, and then I will the cat's out of the bag. Yeah. Well, does what about from a performance standpoint? Does that ever get difficult to keep track uh, of the road you've traversed? Because it, it, so much happens, and so many dramatic twists and turns take place. So are you ever worried about uh, continuity or saying something or, or missing something or performing in a certain way? I mean, that's, I mean that, is, that is part of the work because it is a lot of things to track. But there, there, are moments, there are moments when we're filming and like, you're not in an episode. Uh, and so you have this weird like... Like a lag, like a weird like, blip in time. Yeah, you just yeah. Don't, you don't go to work for however many days. You know, it takes us nine days to film an episode. You're not in an episode. You don't come back in and there's like a little like Tin Man effect. You get back in, you're like, eh, 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 what? <laughs> What happened? What happened two episodes ago? Like, where's my Riddler? Where's my Riddler voice? Where does that sit? Uh, yeah, go through that. Do you ever? When, I guess you have enough of the scripts in advance, but do you ever get that anxiety some people get when they miss enough work, where it's like, oh, they're doing just fine without me. <laughs> I wonder, are they going to ask me to come back or not? What's going to? I mean, be? you get you get a little nervous. It was it was when I was frozen at the end of last year. I was like, oh, man. so. <laughs> How long? Is there a refrigerator or like, <laughs> is this, what's the, the plan thaw? here? What's the plan here? You still need me to come be in the ice, Warner right? You st <laughs> what you, I'm like, did I say something? <laughs> Am I difficult? Nobody's ever safe on Gotham. Yeah, no one's, it's true. But also people, people have died three times and come back. <laughs> That's true. We've also and we've also had Chelsea Spack, who was Kristen Kringle, and yeah. then Isabella, who I think was the luckiest of all. Played two completely different characters, same actress. Yeah, yeah it's pretty. Well, the, I think something that the that Gotham does uh, wonderfully is it's at the same time I think very faithful to a lot of the tone and the legacy of Batman, but it also knows when to deviate, when to take its own path and, and turn something on its head. Are, are do you, are you ever overwhelmed by the depth of the legacy of this character, of this franchise, of this story? Is it ever a lot to take in? Is there ever a, a nervousness or, about what you're about to tackle or which way you're going to go? Certainly at the beginning. Uh, season one was petrifying for a couple reasons. One, uh, I, it was my first long form TV show. So I didn't really know how it worked, what I was allowed to ask. Uh, you know, our show, our writers and our showrunner and executive producers are in LA. So that, that relationship is, you know, it, they're just not around. So you have to reach out and it's, it's about communicating email and phone and, really keeping up with it. And I was a bit shy my first year because I, I didn't know what I could do. Um, and then of course you're like taking on an iconic role and telling a part of it that hasn't been told. And something I really wanted to do from the beginning was start as far away as possible. So you're, you're setting up an audience to be like, that's not, that's not the Riddler, that's not the guy, that's not the villain that we love. And it's like, well, yeah, no, because we gotta be like doofus first and then kind of like get the cojones. You know, we have to like earn, we have to earn the danger. So what's been, but what's been so nice is I, it's, it's always felt like this, our audience has been uh, really supportive and like involved on social media and voicing, uh, you know, voicing their like affirmation and, and their approval from the beginning. So I, I felt, I felt comfortable after a while of once I got like my footing and felt like I was making, you know, solid choices for, for our world. Uh, and then since then, it's just been fun. Because now it's like, 
we're on a ride and you know that this character is so much in my body that yeah. it feels like when I go to work like I'm just I'm kind of ready For sure. and then all the fun gets to be like when you get paired up with someone that's unexpected and you're like oh this is going to be great yeah. this like because you know it's like this was a surprising this was a surprising yeah, thing surprising you're like us, oh yeah. how nice this is going to bring out something completely different that I wasn't even I couldn't even plan on well that's the fun part about the show right like if you had told me in season one that like Lee and Enigma and Grundy were going to be like a thing by season four. I couldn't possibly draw the lines to connect those dots, but it's so much fun to watch. What do you think it is about your characters that, that make that trio or, 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 or duo work? What is it that makes it click and work so well? I think part well? of it is what you touched on that is just so out of left field in a way, but these, these characters have traveled, not literally, but figuratively, to where they are now, and they need each other in a bizarre way. You know, she's sort of like hit her the end of the line in Gotham City and she left and came back and the only way to come back was to live underground, to not be known by anybody, to do her own thing, to try to help out of guilt and then, you know, you got this guy, where's this guy gonna go? I mean, <laughs> he was frozen, he thawed, he's gotta, he's gotta lay low and figure out his stuff. Yeah. yeah. So it kind of works perfectly. Yeah, it, 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 uh, it did work perfectly and then I think, uh, Maureen and I have a, a similar sort of I don't know. I feel like we have a, a, a complementary intensity that she and I have that just kind of like works together in a really nice way. It makes them seem like, you know, there's something about right. them that is that is just naturally in tune, despite how different they are, and despite the fact that she is caring and generous and taking care of people in the narrows, and I'm pretty much there to take advantage of them and, <laughs> you know, <laughs> climb my way up on their shoulders and foreheads. You know, yeah, Riddler stuff. Yeah, Riddler style, man. <laughs> um, let me ask you a question. When you guys got paired up, Marina, you you have experience working with these franchises. You've done voiceover work for years. You're one of those uh, rare uh, people in the industry that have a foothold on both sides of the nerd kingdom fence. You've got DC <laughs> and Marvel stuff under your belt. You you've experienced a lot. W was there? Uh, y you know, did you guys have conversations uh, ab about where to go with this duo or about how to handle this fandom even early on in the beginning, knowing what you were getting into? To. Has this been different than the other things you've worked on in this world? I had no idea what I was getting into. None. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, have, I have to say, like, I just sort of have luckily fallen upon these universes, and, and it works. It works for me. I like stories. I like grand stories, and I like mythological figures, and, and this is exactly what this universe is. And so I get to, I love that I get to be in both and play very different characters in both. And, like, the Deadpool world is compl is a, its own thing. Oh I mean, it's like its own genre, you know. So f Gotham feels almost like a, a like a very serious, legit thing compared to like the insanity of the Deadpool world. Yeah. And it's nice to be able to dabble in both. Yeah, have a little bit of each. Yeah. Keep you sane. I know. Uh, I think I read somewhere else that you weren't, which is funny considering like what your career has become with these big, big temple moments, these big franchises. But you weren't really into comics that much when you were a kid. Is that right? Or no, no, not no, at all. Not really. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So one. Not at all. What What was your thing? Looking back, well, when you were a kid, what What was your weird kid thing that you did? <laughs> the weird question. No, I'm kidding. I I my brother was really into the comics, so like I ended up like at Forbidden Planet in New York City all the time with my brother. So like I was soaking it in without knowing it really, but I was into like Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, yeah. Oh. Did you hear the, yeah, the excitement the in there. Reaction from oh, the this is so good. That, that was more my thing, <laughs> or like the labyrinth yeah. and. Oh. Um, What's the never ending story like that kind of like which has like a fa fantasy quality sure. and aspect yeah, to yeah. it. So I wouldn't say I was immune to that, you know. Yeah, world. So, it, so you weren't really like physical comic books weren't your thing, but you were always enamored with sort of the fantasy yeah. and the, and the mytholo mythological world exactly. and all that sort of stuff. Exactly. Yeah, for sure. Corey, what about you, man? What was your, what was your thing as a kid? Uh, I didn't grow up with comic books either. Yeah. I, have an, I have a brother who's two years older, and neither of us we just didn't read them. Our parents never gave us comics that wasn't like part of our household. Uh, my, my brother was, um, oh, and we didn't really play video games. We had, we had the original Nintendo, okay. and that was it. So we were just like. Began and end right there. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, we would play Super Mario Brothers. Yeah. Um, I was always Luigi. Uh, younger brother, of course. Yeah, younger brother, and taller. Um, <laughs> so uh, neither of us have impressive facial hair, though. Uh, 
Yeah. And then. So you did like green to begin with. I mean, yeah. Didn't he have a green? Oh didn't he have a green outfit? Oh my gosh! It's your moment of irony. Uh, I was. I did music, so I spent a lot of time cool. at a piano. Yeah. yeah. Growing up, I wanted to be a concert pianist, so I was like. You don't know this about Corey, but every time we work together, he's got about a song a minute. It's like if there's ever like some downtime on set, he's singing something, and I get a million songs stuck in my head every single day I work with him. Do you ever just walk up to a? Are you the guy that Sound walks crack. up to a piano at a party and just starts playing and singing songs? And like, I sometimes do that. Yeah, depends on how much I've been drinking. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, but no, I I do do that. I actually, so I I I trained like classically for a while, and then um, I just I I decided I didn't want to go to school for piano, and I just stopped studying. And my grandparents just gave me, like, they just kept buying me uh, books of, like, popular music, stuff that they wanted to hear that I normally didn't play. And so it was kind of like when I started really learning theory and looking at, like, chord structure of songs and understanding uh, and just kind of, like, embellishing and making stuff up and improving, which is then when I uh, decided to go to college and study jazz piano as, like, a minor. Uh, so I can look at, like, guitar chords. Like, you can pull up on your phone like a popular song, I just look at the guitar chords and kind of like jam it out and piece it together. So like some, there will, there will be, a, you know, if I'm over at someone's place and everyone wants to kind of... Well, let me, is there anything in that toolkit right there that you just described that you ever find yourself tapping into on set or as an actor or anything like that? Uh, what do you mean? Well, like you're saying, uh, the way that you can sort of analyze a thing, take it apart and you can figure out just with the chords of what this is and what that is, do you ever find like that part of your brain activating when you're figuring out how to tackle a character or a performance? Yeah, sure. I, well, I think, I mean, music for me as an actor was is like a serious way in. Anytime I have a character, I always, uh, a new character, I always make a, like a playlist cool. for them, uh, especially if, it, if the role requires sort of like... Um, emotional vulnerability. It really helps me to like have like theme songs for this person. Uh, so that's something I always do. And then I, I'm i from the theater, so scene work for me needs to have like a natural flow. Sometimes you work with film and TV actors who have never been on stage and they don't understand pacing. They don't, you know, because you can rely on an editor to put something together later. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm so much about like the music of a scene and the rhythm of it and how it flows and how it feels and how that activates emotion in you that for me, working and rehearsing a scene and actually performing it on set needs to kind of feel not orchestrated in a way that it needs to be repeated the same way every time, but it needs to feel musical to me. Sure. If it feel, yeah, if it feels flat, it's like, Sure, an editor can go in and make this work, but it's just so much less fun. Feed the performance. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. feed the performance. It's just not fun. Uh, so the actors that, that understand that kind of like music and play with someone are, are always my favorite people to work with. Would you say, to tie it back to what we were saying earlier, that's part of why the dynamic duo here, uh, for, forgive the use of that term, <laughs> but, uh, but why like your pairing on screen has worked so well? You guys both kind of operate in a similar, similar wavelength. Like, would you agree to that? that yeah, yeah. yeah, I think so. I mean, I think... And I think where we are opposites, it works to create a different kind of musicality, you know, where we can play off each other and try to drag each other into each other's rhythm. Yeah, that actually happened a lot, especially early on this season, because we hadn't been around each other a lot, and so we had the two characters hadn't had the same kind of influence, just the natural influence on each other, which has happened as the season has gone on. And so you had... Uh, I, w I was losing my mind. I didn't have any of my skill set left, so I was just like... I had picked up Grundy and, you know, just had this big, like, piece of meat, you know, standing next to me that could hurt people. And I was feeling cocky and, like, you know, I was like, I was like, oh, no one's going to mess with me. So, like, I was feeling a little, like, loose and scrappy, which was kind of new. And she was so hard and cold uh, at the top of, of the season. So it was really, it was really fun because it just felt like, it felt like this constant, like, poking thing. Right. Until, like, you know... And then and we broke each other down a little bit. Yeah, we like broke each other down, and I I got a little like we got a little mellow. Yeah, I mellowed out a little bit. I got a little softer. <laughs> yeah. Let me ask you a question. I'm watching this, and uh, without spoiling it, as much as you can answer this, what is the end game? I know the idea is is to restore the Narrows to almost like like a former state of glory to help the Narrows to bring the. How good could it possibly be? It's the Narrows. Like what are you? What well, is the it's whole not. It's less about. It's honestly less about 
uh, restoring and it's more about just providing. Yeah. So they don't have hospitals or schools. Everybody's in dire straits and living hand to mouth. And it's about giving them a sense of community and a sense of like the only, and that's sort of what the speech is in this episode I have on Thursday is about like enabling, enabling them to help each other get out of the same thing, not fight against each other and destroy each other is only when you guys unite will you be able to be strong. I don't care about those people. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just, I'm supporting her. I, I you want can get power. What you want. I, we need money. I'm like, let's just, you know, let's get the thing rolling. Let's Green suits aren't out. cheap, my friend. We've got to. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the thing, the thing that Ed gets really into is like, you know, I was doing the performances. I became a bit of a figurehead at the club. And I was like, <laughs> you know, I had my Sally Field moment. I'm like, oh, they love me. <laughs> they really love me. Oh, how wonderful. This is so great. And she's like actually caring about the people. But it is it's something it's it's something about our two characters. You know, she breaks me down in a way that I start to get a little soft and you know, I like am doing things to help these people. Mostly it's for her uh and for my gain, but she makes me she brings out a better side of Ed. Um and but, but we compliment, not to interrupt you, but we compliment each other in a way that, like, as a leader, I wouldn't survive on my own. He's got the, the street smarts and the, you know, not necessarily literally the muscles, but, like, to be able to get her, you know, tell her, like, you need the muscles. I Let's just started back with in. the trainer, guys. I'm actually so sore right now. <laughs> she squeezed my arm and it hurts. Oh, God. Uh, muscles, muscles are coming in a couple years. Together we make, the, we make one good leader. In a way. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but I, but the 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 thing now that we're gonna deal with is uh, this this kind of like softness and kindness that she brings out in me is kind of uh, incongruous with with the Riddler that still exists in me and the want to regain that sort of power and mental command uh, and get a little ornery, you know, and wreak a little havoc and make people really pay mind to me uh and the sort of um identity crisis that i have in this this uh you know contention of these two things uh these two these two minds um and how they f physically manifest themselves as ed and the riddler you know we will find ourselves back in that zone again and i have to make a decision you know can the riddler exist in this world with her yeah. is she impeding my ability to be the Riddler and have the kind of like power that I had before. Uh, and so does that mean that I need to get rid of her or can we work together in this? And what do I do with this fondness that I have for her and what is that? Well, it's all very exciting and, uh, and it starts this Thursday, guys, March 1st. It's back, second half begins. Uh, we're gonna turn over audience Q&A in just a second, but uh, I wanna deviate slightly before we do from Gotham and just, I wouldn't be doing my job, Marina. First thing I have to ask, I know you can't say probably anything, but uh, what can you, if anything, about Deadpool 2? Deadpool has it been just as much fun as making the first one? Are you excited for everyone to see it too? How's it going, what can you say? Anything? Very excited for everybody to see it. Yeah. I haven't seen it yet. Um, but I can tell from shooting it, uh, you're going to love it. Uh, but also, it was a combination of, you know, it was exciting to get Wade and Vanessa back together again. We yeah. see, like, their relationship. They're taking their relationship to a new level. Okay. So you can think about what that means. Uh, also, you know, the first one's more of, like, an origin story, right? About how he gets his powers. And whereas this one, it's more about him finding his purpose, his mission, what makes him tick. Um, so that's... Pretty much what I can tell you. Cool. <laughs> was there, when you were doing the first one, were, were, were you surprised by how far that moved? I think that was part of the charm, was we didn't know how far Ryan Reynolds was going to take us on this right. weird fever pretty dream. Pretty far. Yeah, pretty far. Yeah, no, and he, <laughs> guess what? He doesn't hold back. He doesn't hold back. So I, I, I was, I don't want to say concerned. I was curious, going into two, were you like, oh, okay, I know what to expect. I already made one of these. So I had the same concern, right? And I was reading the script, and I was like, I know what this is going to be. Yeah. People will still love it, but it'll be what they expect. Right. And then I kept turning the page, and I kept going, holy <laughs> shit. Like, what? How, how did he do this? Like, how did they figure out how to, like, go beyond the first yeah. one, you know, and still surprise? So I think... That's pretty there, without 
No, no like that's really overhyped it. <laughs> I mean, you didn't say anything we weren't all hoping and thinking. Yeah, so. no, I, I mean, I, <laughs> that's fantastic. I, excuse me, I really think you'll enjoy it. Awesome, very excited to hear that. And Corey, I, I wanted to ask you, I saw you posting a lot. Uh, uh, what's going on South by Southwest, 1985, the film, man? What's yeah. going on there? Talk a little bit um, about that, yeah. So I, I, uh, I shot a film last June. Uh, it's the first time I'm leading a film, uh, and I executive produced it, um, along with plenty of other people. Uh, <laughs> um, but it's, uh, it's a really beautiful story. I actually just saw the final, final version yeah. Uh, of it, and we had a press screening last night for it uh, with a bunch of um, exciting folks here in New York. Um, it is, uh, it's really sad. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's it's really beautiful. It's uh, it it deals with the AIDS crisis in the 80s, mm -hmm. um, but in a way that it's not about uh, the politics. It's not about the activism. It's not about the the medical uh, details or crisis. It's, uh, it's about a young man going home to Texas in 1985 uh, for Christmas, um, knowing his own reality and, you know, dealing with a typical American family and deciding if and how to talk about this. And uh, the film kind of deals with the secrets that everyone keeps to themselves uh, to protect the family or... Um, you know, to protect themselves. And so it's, it's a lot about family and communication and sacrifice and secrets and, uh, and love, you know, the love that, that, that keeps a family together and keeps people alive and memories of people alive. Uh, it, it was a, I, I loved working on it and it's, I'm really proud of it. Did you, um, it, well, it sounds beautiful. Did you, did you find time to work on that while you were on Gotham? Did you, did you do it? In, was this while you were in the ice? This was, was this, this was, well, <laughs> kind of. Uh, this was during our hiatus last spring. My last day of shooting on that film was the first day of shooting season four. So, uh, it weird back I wasn't to back. working that much because <laughs> I was you were frozen. in a block of ice. So they let me miss the first day. Uh, yeah, so it, it backs right up into it. it was some great. poor PA had to get into the ice block. <laughs> hey, you're not going to see his face anyway. Actually. Put somebody, put somebody else that's in That's not there. always me on that ice block. I will say that. <laughs> that's not always me. It was hot in there. Those were long days. How ironic. It yeah, was hot in a block of ice. Yeah. I was like, you know what? When you need, like, a face shot, I'm your guy. I'm your guy. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, again, guys, March 1st for Gotham. Uh, I keep an eye out. Deadpool 2, we all know what's going on there. And then where can people go to find out info about your film? Uh, you can go to 1985thefilm.com cool. uh, to learn more about it. And we're we're premiering it opening night at South by Southwest on March Correct. 9th. So Correct. you can yeah. read about it more after March Absolutely. 9th. They'll have a bunch of stuff online, I'm sure. Very, very cool. Guys, I could do this all day, but I, I literally can't. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to the audience. They, they won't let me keep talking to you. we got we got to get some questions from our fans over here. So what do we got? I think the first one's right here. Hi. I was right. Hi. Um, my question is for Corey. Uh -huh. Is there going to be a Riddler-centric, like how the Riddler got his name in this upcoming episodes? And will we see Ed in a different outfit, like a spandex, maybe? <laughs> uh, no to the spandex. <laughs> I, I, have, I have begged them to, to stay far away from that material. Uh, but I'm very excited to share that uh, one of my favorite comics, when I was, when I was uh, prepping the role initially, before uh, we started season one, there was a, a comic that I read called The Riddle Factory. Um, and I would suggest you all read it because it's really fun. And it's, it's a huge, uh, it was a huge inspiration of the brand of Riddler that I wanted. Uh, it feels really dangerous and um, just read it. I, I, won't, I won't break down the whole story, but it's, it's a really great version of the Riddler. Um, and essentially the, the plot is he sets up this underground game show and uh, people don't know where it's going to be until last minute. It's like warehousey and he... Uh, and he calls people up, and they have to figure out a. They have to. He like challenges to them, them to a riddle, and if they get it wrong, then they get kind of tortured. But these people do it because they just love it. And I, I had said to our producers and writers, I was like, I love this comic so much, and I would love to have something similar. And we have a. Uh, we have an episode called The Riddle Factory. Uh, it'll be episode seventeen, and it uh, plays with that a lot. And we have. Some awesome. That's fun. That's a fun one. Yeah, that's a really fun one for us too. And like some new stuff happens. Yeah, yeah. It gets really, it gets really exciting. Sorry, I'm distracted because apparently somebody just showed up. There's I believe it's Maria. Do we have a streaker? No, no, yeah. it, it's not. Oh, it's, uh, okay. 
<laughs> it was exciting. I was like, who's out there? Is uh, there a streaker? Our next guest, I believe it's Maria Shriver, is uh, coming in. Oh, right I now. have her books back. Uh, and, yep, no, back confirmed, not a streaker. Not a streaker. Not. Maria is not. No, no she is fully clothed. Uh, <laughs> I'm not streaking. Um, internet, there's still time. We have a few more questions. The streaker, you can make it. Uh, we, our next question is going to come. Oh, before we do that, thank you for that question. And thank you for writing it down. Very professional. I'm, I appreciate that. Yeah, that was a great question. Thank yeah. you. Uh, next question right here in the middle. How does it feel to be filming in Steiner Studios compared to public places? Oh. Mm. It's a little safer. <laughs> <laughs> no streakers. Um, it, it's, it actually feels like home, so it, it is nice. It's comfortable, and especially in the winter where, you know, we're shooting long nights sometimes. And it's 20 degrees outside, and it's nice to just be in our cozy studio and in our dressing rooms, and we like to hang out together out there, and then when we're on location, it's a little bit more spread out and just a little less comfortable. Yeah, I'll say the summer months, I really like Steiner. Yeah. The winter months, I really like Steiner. Yeah. And when it's beautiful outside, I'm down. Yeah. You know? When it's that perfect temperature. It is true, though. Occasionally, you, like, look behind you, and you're shooting in an alley with the Brooklyn Bridge over, and it's snowing yeah. outside, and you're like, well, it's like a fairy tale, but it's freezing. It's pretty remarkable. Yeah, but, we, you know, we, we don't get to change our costumes. Yeah. I'm like, shouldn't I have more coats? They're like, no, you're in the green suit now. We got to see the green suit. And it's like, okay. it's four degrees outside. It's four. I mean, like, there are days when it's so cold. I have to wear, like, three pairs of long johns under my pants. I'm like, my bum's going to look really good in this shot because my legs are looking super muscular, and no one knows that it's because I have three pairs of long johns on. Yeah. Yeah, man. So, you know, there are sometimes benefits. I get, I get, I'm get, i looking a little more bulky and, and strong in, in the winter months. <laughs> Thank you for that. I think we got time for a few more questions. Next one's going to be from uh, right... Oh, I'm going to do right here. I see a microphone. Let's get, the, let's get you in there. Hi. Um, first off, Corey, I have to say, I grew up loving the Riddler. You are my favorite incarnation of the Riddler. Thank you. So I, I just that. wanted to say that. Also, you two have had some of the hardest, most tragic stories throughout the years on Gotham. And now that you guys are working together and it's a little bit more lighthearted, what do you do in between scenes to keep that lightheartedness up, knowing that you're so dark coming from behind? I sing to her. Yeah, a lot of singing. It's a lot of singing. I yeah. show him a lot of photos of my kids. What do you sing? Uh, everything. everything. Like, for <laughs> example, like, for example, earlier we did, uh, we did like morning news shows. So we like sit and we just stare in a camera and we can't see the people we're talking to. And like different cities patch in. And so different cities patch in. And of course, uh, Orlando was like the second one. And I don't know if any of you are Book of Mormon fans, yeah. uh, but you know, when it was Orlando, I was like, Orlando, I love you, Orlando, Sea World and Disney and Putt Putt Golfing. This is literally us sitting in our chairs in between takes. You've just experienced it. Yeah. Fantastic. Or did you ever sing back? Do you ever had a song for him? You don't want to hear me sing. Got it. Okay, moving on. Moving on. Yeah, I think for a while the one that I that we were really doing was uh, I don't want to live forever. That you know, because when Zane gets on, gets going and goes, baby. That's one of my. That's one of my. That was one, that was that one was that was lingering for days. I couldn't get that one out. It's probably coming back. What's the song? Uh, and you're gonna hate me for asking this. A song that got stuck in your head, couldn't get out, was there for the longest time, drove you nuts. Don't do it. I know. <laughs> Go ahead. I, I, let me rephrase that. Ruin everyone's day. <laughs> Tell us uh, a song. Well, the one that I have in my head now is because I brought it up last night. But um, have you guys ever seen Beetlejuice, yeah. the greatest yeah. musical number in a movie almost ever? Dale. <laughs> he said, Dale, daylight come and it won't go home. Dale. <laughs> it's so good. I just, so now I have that scene just playing in my head and I keep singing. You gotta that. do that one part. Dale. We said that. We he said, said that. He said that. That's, that's the yeah, whole thing. So you gotta do that part. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you for that. Uh, there are worse songs to have stuck in your head. Uh, I'm getting a signal from Randy. We've got one more. One more question. Let's go ahead. Hi, guys. Uh, online questions are kind of going nuts. Um, and one of them, it's, it's really nice that you started singing because one of the questions is, uh, would we ever see a musical Gotham episode? We've gotten that question a lot, a lot lately. lately. That's interesting. Yeah, people, you know, How I'm, you I'm a fan of that? giving the people what they want, yeah. but uh, Danny Cannon, who uh, is an executive producer and, and like the main director of the show, has a serious allergy to the idea. <laughs> I'm so glad he said that. <laughs> of having a musical episode. So 
They did, you know, they did let uh, Penguin and Riddler, or Penguin and Ed, have uh, a little little duet. You guys had thing. a musical interlude. Yeah, and they and they gave um, they gave Penguin a kind of fantasy number. So they've, you know, they've indulged. They've dabbled. They've dabbled. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if we'll ever see a full episode, <laughs> but I would be down. <laughs> Just saying. Never say never. I would be down. Um, I can't thank you guys enough for doing this. This was so much fun. Uh, I really had a blast. I hope you did as well. Thank you guys for your questions. Uh, we got to wrap it up, but one more time. March 1st. Yeah, go ahead and make some noise. March 1st, Gotham returns. Keep an eye for Deadpool 2. Check out 1985, the film. Make some noise for Corey and Miranda. Everybody, come on. Come on. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Thanks for having me.